Thank you for joining us. We're excited to bring you our next webinar in the Soft Critical Issues series. Just to give you context, Mission Essential is the largest provider of language services to DoD. We've completed over 100,000 missions with 20,000 linguists in 83 countries. Specific to SOCOM, we currently have over 400 personnel in theater. Our services there include language, culture, and intelligence. We hope this conversation will inform and inspire you. Uh, today, we're lucky enough to have three panelists with us who are experts in soft linguistics. The actual mission of a soft linguist and how they support the soft community is critical to our warfighters, our elite warfighters throughout the world. Um, today, we'll dig into the journey of a soft linguist in their task supporting those special operators in the critical missions. We have three expert panelists joining us in the discussion with diverse perspectives in linguistic soft support. Jeff Malcolm, who I've had the pleasure of working with for years, um, Jeff was a colonel, uh, retired as a colonel, sorry, in the United States Air Force, um, eight years enlisted and 18 as an officer, primarily communications and intelligence career fields. Retired from Ramstein Air Force Base in 2005 and was hired to stand up the NATO Intelligence Fusion Center at RAF Molesworth, UK. He worked there as a director of staff for 10 years before transitioning to AFRICOM Command. Um, when Jeff joined Mission Essential as a, as a PM, I had the pleasure of working with him and we, have, we together have been successful in building our European Command language support, um, as well as some other contracts as well, including Kosovo. Um, he, was, he runs our European operations today and he oversees all of Mission Essential's uh, intel and language work in Europe. Our next panelist, uh, Ross. Uh, Ross has been with Mission Essential for 11 years. I had the pleasure of meeting Ross in, in Bagram a few years ago. Um, fantastic linguist, and I'm going to let him introduce more about himself. And Ahmed, Ahmed, who's been a linguist for 13 years, but with us for three years, uh, both in Afghanistan, both Ross and Ahmed are in Afghanistan uh, and perform critical support to warfighters in Afghanistan as a part of the Mission Essential team. So with that introduction, I'm going to pass it off to you, Jeff, first. Maybe you can just introduce yourself a little bit better than I did uh, and, uh, and tell us what it is about the soft mission maybe that, um, that's so important and critical to you. And then we'll go on to Ross and Ahmed. All right, thanks a lot, Brian. So I've been working in the, in the language business just for a couple of years, not like uh, the other gentlemen on the call. So I'm still learning each and every day, but when it comes to the soft mission, I mean, the one thing I, I've learned about is, is flexibility. When you're operating in a small team environment, uh, we don't need linguists uh, who, as I like to say, color inside the lines. We need ones that can color outside the lines when, when that's what the environment calls for. So uh, one of the things I stress to our leadership in the field is when you're, when you're interviewing uh, folks to come on board to support our soft operations, it's really important to kind of understand what their uh, personalities are like and how are they going to do under pressure are they going to be able to um, contribute to the team? Because when the going gets tough out there in austere conditions, we need people that can uh, be flexible, take orders, and uh, and help just to contribute to whatever it takes. Be up at you know beyond uh, just the linguistics piece of it. So very good. Um, I'm Ross. I'm, I've been with the company for almost 11 years, and I've been through all of Afghanistan. I have traveled everywhere. All the missions that I've had it has been involved on all different kinds of you know tactics, but most of it intel work. And um, uh, recently, I was in Kaya for a few years. Now I am in uh, BAF working with the command in here for the commander of uh, BAF in here in Kabul and in, in actually in Bagram. Okay, thanks, Ross. Hi there. Sorry. This is Ahmad. Um, I, as, as Brian mentioned, I've been, I've been uh, working as a linguist um, for, for multiple years now. However, um, I started off as a, as a local national linguist uh, in Afghanistan. This was back uh, ages ago, 2007. Uh, uh, and then I did, I did that for quite a bit. Uh, that was, to me, was the, the um, and I still to date, I appreciate all the, the things I did back then that, that uh, basically molded me into something that gave me the confidence to be able to uh, do the job uh, as best as I can. Obviously, I'm far from being perfect now too, but uh, it at least uh, made me realize that, that being a linguist is not just speaking and the ability to speak a language. It has so many other uh, uh, 
factors that, that one needs to learn in a practical world on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to build that confidence and work towards it. So I did that for, for about five, six years uh, as a local national linguist, uh, moved to United States, uh, joined the United States Army. I did uh, about one, one term uh, active duty uh, and I was, my, my military specialty, occupational specialty was uh, linguist too, they call it Z Zero Nine Lima. So uh, I didn't break up with the linguist world. I still kept on doing the same job. And then after I got out, I've been with Mission Essential for three years now. Um, so not saying I've seen everything there is about being a linguist and being, working with military and especially soft units, but uh, I'm quite sure uh, I've seen um, enough to where I can feel semi-confident about uh, uh, knowing the sensitivities and the, the uh, flexibility that it requires a, uh, from a linguist to be able to do the job. Thanks, Emma. Yeah. So, and, and let me pull the thread on that a little bit because I'm very familiar with the Zero Non Lima program. It's a, it was a great path for a lot of uh, uh, citizens like yourself to, to build uh, build their kind of repertoire with the United States Army and come in. Um, let's go back to when you were a local national um, and, ask, and let me just ask, building that confidence you talked about um, yourself, but also building it with the teams you were working with. Can you, can you give me a little bit about um, what that was like or how you, how you were able to do that? Oh yeah, Brian, uh, definitely looking back to at when I first started, uh, it's like, being an alien and landing in, in somewhere where you don't know what's going on around you, especially being totally unfamiliar with the military uh, culture and how military does business. Uh, it was a, a, a totally different world, a new world for me and that I stepped in. Because before then, I used to work with the civilians, United Nations organizations or uh, nonprofit organizations mostly. Uh, so I had a totally different uh, experience of, of work environment. Um, at the start, it was definitely challenging, but I'm still thankful to, to the um, comrades and colleagues back then that helped me uh, build uh, that experience and helped me work through it, through the hardships. I was never perfect. Uh, they definitely played a, a huge role in, in uh, building that confidence in me and uh, introducing me to this environment uh, to where I was finally comfortable working around military. And I'm actually so comfortable with military now that I run away from civilians. Um, so it, it's, it was a, quite a good experience for me. Thanks, Ma. That, um That's great. Uh, Jeff, if I can just go back to you for a second um, and maybe just by way of a little more introduction, um, what, what kind of linguist did you work with in your career as, a, as whether enlisted or as an officer in the Air Force or outside of that world before coming to Mission Ascension? Yeah, I didn't have any experience at all with linguists. And so uh, my career, as I mentioned earlier, had been primarily supporting intel and communications. Um, when I first came to Mission Essential, I worked on the intel side and everybody said, you know, we primarily have the intel side and language side and boy you know the language side is really different well I, i've not found that to be the case actually as far as um, the expectations from the customer are the same and uh, certainly the people that we have providing support to the customer are at the highest level just like they were on the intel side so i i've not found it to be that much of a transition the uh, places where we operate are much broader and so i've had to kind of get used to that because, um, you know, one of the, one of the pieces um, that I think is absolutely critical is that um, when we provide a linguist to a customer, it's not just the linguistic skills that we're providing. And I, I'd be really interested in listening to Ross and Ahmed as far as their uh, perspective as well. But, you know, earlier I talked about kind of coloring outside the lines. When we send a linguist out, they're expected to do things in accordance with these job descriptions. But you know, when they're in a situation, they, they're doing a lot of other things. Um, one of the critical things is providing uh, cultural advisory services, and that's kind of a more of a formal term, but um, regardless of where any of these locations are that I mentioned earlier across Europe, it doesn't matter. I hear consistently from the customers that the cultural perspective 
that the linguist brain we lost is your voice. absolutely um, critical to mission success. Um, so, let me, Russ, let me let me let me pose a similar question to you just before your your um, time on Mission Essential. Maybe um, a, a little bit about what it was like uh, making the transition yourself into this role. Um, obviously, you know you weren't you haven't always been a linguist, and learning that definitely. that piece, uh, walking into yeah. that role and and working with our soldiers um, downrange. What the what's that been like? Uh, well, to be honest with you, I have a, a, a medicine uh, background. I am a veterinarian. By you know, I was licensed, but um, I'm not now. But since I've been, you know, with the uh, with medicine, I lost my uh, my license. But um, but all of this, we have to update. I have to update my my license again. But so there's hope. As soon as you're done, that, you can go back to being a vet, veterinarian, isn't it? Exactly, is yes. You, gotta, you, you know, plan. to be honest with you, yes. I made a lot of friends just for, you know, as soon as they found out that I was a vet, you know, they brought in their kids, kitties, you know, for vaccines, for little, you know, little physicals or things like that. And they were, you know, I made a lot of friends, you know, with, uh, coming from that background. But mm -hmm. what I would like to add in here as a linguist, well, you know, we all have to learn, you know, all the linguists some keywords and also dialects and just to be able to adapt to the mission tempo and also the diversities that we see, you know, through our mission. And that itself is, is at times could be challenging, but meanwhile, very interesting, very, very, uh, and a lot of different ways uh, entertaining. Uh, which I thought was for me because, uh, you know, traveling through different parts of Afghanistan, um, I found that, that, you know, no matter what, as a linguist, you always have to be ready. And no, you know, not just be ready, be ready physically and also mentally and also be ready to go for, you know, for anything that might be, you know, that you may not even know that might be happening. And it is, it's be ready in like a war zone ready. So that itself, it took me a while to develop that. And the, because it was just not mentally, but also physically. And also, you know, a challenge part was that to, to be, you know, physically fit to be, you know, to uh, just work out like, like, like Ahmed did. Like, you know, many and me and him, we worked out together when I was in Kaya. And also a bunch of other friends that we met in, uh, you know, in our, in our offices and everywhere else. It was for us, for me, it was very challenging, manual, very interesting, because now I feel like I am like one of them. I can do it, you know, I'm, although I'm getting old, but I could do just as much, you know, as much as they could, you know, physically yeah, yeah. or mentally. And not only that, at times, we you know, when the, the election was going on in Afghanistan, there was a warehouse that they were, you know, I, I, I used to work with the, with the G3 in there that was a three store in Kaya. And he, was, he had to overwatch the votes, casting the votes. And in there, we saw so much stuff that was very, very interesting, mainly just casting the votes and also counting them. To mm -hmm. us, it was very interesting. We were part of that. And it just actually part of that made me feel like, hey, we are not just, you know, in this mission to, to learn, but also be part of the history of this country that, hey, we are, you know, we are an active part of it. And that itself are experiences in life that don't come too easily. And uh, to be honest with you, a lot of other things that I have learned was, you know, from being a part of the SAF. SAF uh, people, they, they were the most... Um, uh, educated people, the, the, the most friendly people that I have to say that they would work with me like, uh, like we were brothers, like family members. And that itself, it gives you the enthusiasm that, hey, I'm, if he's saving my life, he's concerned about me or my life. I have to do everything to be concerned about his life and whatever else that, that, that he's got in the mission, which was the mission plan. And to, so to succeed in there, we all had to be, you know, on one on one, you know, plan, on one idea, one mentality to make us, to make us achieve the, 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 the final goal. And with that came a lot of self-satisfaction, you know, by, you know, being an active part of the, of the, of the plan and also being suc successful at the end. And then not only that, they also contributed most of that success to the linguist. And that made you feel special, like, hey, you're, you did something good today. You did something that uh, you made a change, you know, you made a difference and, you know, in yourself and also in your career. Great. Yeah. No, thanks, Ross. And, and, and talking with the um, concept of 
keeping yourself obviously mentally fit to be, be able to perform the job as a linguist. Um, but the physical fitness too is interesting. And, and um, Ahmad, I'll, I'll reach to you next. Um, the, the soft kind of um, world in supporting soft and supporting the, uh, the mission tempo, the, um, what, what it means to be out there supporting the guys who are at the pointiest end of the spear. Um, how has that changed uh, since you've been doing this for as long as you have, you know, over the past uh, decade or so, how has that changed from what it was when you started to maybe um, what's required today or the, the mission types or what's, what's evolved to the, the responsibilities of a linguist supporting soft? Um, so, yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, very good question. Uh, I actually, before even this question was brought up or uh, before you brought it up, uh, I, I started feeling these, these uh, huge uh, tangible changes in the way we do uh, the, the missions that are carried out, carried out, especially as far as linguist uh, uh, role is concerned. Uh, even though I haven't had, so my 13 years of time, uh, as linguist, whether it was local, national, in the military, or now with Mission Essential, I uh, I did not spend much time or a lot of time with soft units uh, directly on the ground doing tactical operations. However, I was almost always uh, in the in the behind the scenes, if you will, and uh, supporting them in one way or another. Um, and I could feel that uh, the 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 way the missions were being carried out back then and uh, versus how it is now. The biggest change I see now is uh, back then it was more tactical um, oriented or focused. Uh, so basically going out on, uh, uh, to the villages and actually do, uh, doing missions, uh, uh, whether it was with teams, squads or whatever. Uh, as time uh, uh, has changed now, uh, I see the difference that uh, the focus is more on the operational level. And uh, even sometimes, or a lot of times, it's at the strategic level. So Afghans are not uh, taking their baby steps as they were 19 years ago now. Uh, Afghan special ops units or, or regular units, army, police, they have had the, enough training to, to be able to carry out the missions now with minimal supervision and, and advising, obviously. Uh, so the focus, is, as I see it, has been shifted. The U.S. mentorship or advisory focus has been shifted towards more to the operational planning and strategic level, which uh, to me as a linguist, it makes a huge difference because now I'm not dealing with a squad of soldiers uh, carrying out a mission which uh, did not require a lot of language capabilities and uh, precision, if you will. Um, I could live with it, uh, even though it was dangerous and it was a matter of life and death of people. But the, the terminology and the the day to day job was not as complicated to where I would be struggling with it all the time. Uh, and I could clarify it a lot of times. Now, uh, with the operational setup and the strategic level uh, involvement of linguists, uh, things have changed to where a, a small um, misinterpretation or uh, misinformation uh, conveyed from the linguist to the, the other party could go a long way and, and cause a great damage. So that's the biggest change I see with how uh, linguist roles have changed uh, uh, as it uh, pertains to up-tempo in the missions that we're doing currently. Thank you, Ahmad. Yeah, that's great. And Brian, could you know, I, let me... Could I... Brian, yeah, could I add something to that? Uh, one ahead, thing that I, that I have to uh, add to what, um, what uh, my buddy just said, it, it very nicely said, um, it, it's the flexibility that we see from the soft units. Mm -hmm. The flexibility to adapt all of these tactical or whatever ops or strategic plans to the Afghan level to bring it to the level that was workable to them, to, do, to bring it to the level that was operational on the site with all of us together, with the leaders that they had also, they had limitations. With those limitations, work it out with them and make it and adapt it to, the, to any situation that was going on there and make mm -hmm. it a successful you know, um, outcome from it. And those, those, that was one of the things that I saw with, it, with soft that, was, that I have not seen with other units as much as uh, you know, to make it practical, 
they adapted a lot of their, you know, the tactics and also uh, the operation plans and also strategic plans to Afghan level to the, to the people that they were working at. And sometimes they went through a lot of hardship. It was hard for them because they were used to certain ways of doing things in the beginning. And then later on, they adapted to that. And that flexibility to me was, was making it feel like they are there to make it work however they can, they do their best to make it work. So adapting to flexibility, let's, let's thank you for bringing that up, Ross. I think that's, that's sure. exactly where we should go next, which is talking about um, the, the actual role of a linguist in these flexible environments that these soft operators are creating. You know, you're not just dealing with, um, you know, Ahmad, maybe um, what you were kind of referring to and kind of sitting behind them, you're still dealing with a flexible uh, environment that you're sitting in because the mission that they're performing is not your standard, um, um, you know, just translating of documents or translating of communications between two, two leaders. I mean, these are highly charged situations with incredible um, uh, critical uh, situational impact if, if it's mis misinterpreted or, or as you said, um, misinformation is given. Um, so, so Jeff, with the Intel background a little bit, maybe can you pull a thread on, on wh where your linguists today um, are responding in flexible ways to support our soft operators? Yeah, I'll, I'll give uh, two examples, Brian. The first one is um, more a kind of a geopolitical. So, you know, we're out there supporting the soft operators, uh, but their missions are being driven by what's happened geopolitically. So obviously where we have um, support to those missions, they are um, in some cases unstable areas, uh, ever-changing areas because of what's happened geopolitically. So not only do our customers have to adapt rapidly, but we have to adapt rapidly as well as we're providing that support because we're learning on the fly as they are. Um, so that's one example. The other example actually is COVID environment. Uh, COVID has, you know, posed a lot of challenges. And I was quite uncertain when it all kicked off because I was not sure how this was all going to pan out. And I'll just give you kind of a, an anecdote. So um, it is very common for the linguists to accompany U.S. personnel to a, a foreign medical facility, if you will, because they're with them to make sure that uh, the right diagnosis is given, that the, the symptoms are relayed uh, appropriately to the medical authorities and things of that nature. Well, that's just kind of part and parcel to what the linguists do on a daily basis. That's not a, that's not a big issue. However, with COVID, we're now asking the linguists to be in that COVID environment frequently. So as they take soldiers or civilian personnel to the local uh, military or, excuse me, the local um, civilian medical facility, they're continually placing themselves in a COVID environment. And that to me was a real test of how our folks were going were gonna to react. I actually was concerned to the point where I said, hey, we need to figure out what our response is going to be if, if we get pushback from the linguist. And I'm so proud that in not one instance did we have anybody uh, say, you know what, I, I didn't sign up for this. Uh, that was, to me, was the real uh, key moment of flexibility. You know, we did our best, obviously, to provide them with the PPE that they needed. We wanted them to have all the support that we could give, but still they were exposing themselves on a daily basis and never once did they push back. So to me, that's the most recent example I can think of of flexibility. It wasn't operational, but it was something that was, you know, was the new environment that they were placed into that they responded magnificently to. So I just wanted to mention that. No, that's great. That's great. Thanks. Um, Ahmad, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to you on kind of a similar question, just about ways you had to be flexible. And, and you know, as you talked about um, previously, the different roles you've had, uh, whether supporting indirectly soft units or, or, um, or just conventional or anything in between, uh, the different environments that you've been in, um, what is it like, to, you know, specifically with the linguistic trade, um, what does that mean? Like, how do you how do you do your job differently sitting at a desk translating, you know, maybe a document in front of you versus when you're out, maybe, I don't know, in a village or somewhere else just with a few soldiers trying to um, acquiesce or, or make some situation uh, more, more passable? Um, give, us, give us some of your thoughts there. Thank you, Brian. So um, that's a very interesting uh, topic or subject to talk about. It actually is uh, so encompassing in, in our in the linguist's day-to-day -day, uh, life while on duty, actually, on, on theater or in theater. Um, I have experienced, uh, so 
my expectations versus what I saw coming in here and actually experienced. The expectation was, okay, I'm signing up to be a linguist and I'm going to go uh, maybe set in the meetings, translate, and then uh, have documents and translate those. And I have regular work hours and I, I go home, so everything will be good. Um, contrary to that, I come in here and uh, so my first, uh, with Mission Essential, three years ago, my first duty station was uh, north of Afghanistan. Uh, it was back then uh, a province called Kunduz and uh, it, it wasn't having a very good time. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on the north in general, especially in Kunduz. Um, I ended up there uh, and that's where I realized that oh, uh, I'm not just a linguist. Uh, I, am, uh, I have so many hats, uh, whether that's cultural advisor, whether that's a team player, whether that's a, um, a, 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 another set of eyes to make, make sure we, that, that myself and the team are secure. Uh, whatever, whether it, it was a, a good communicator to make sure there is no uh, uh, conflicts when it comes to cultural sensitivities and uh, linguistic nuances that are that uh, uh, are there all the time and are that sometimes uh, could be very offensive to the to the Afghan parties, especially because they don't understand what uh, Americans. Well, actually, they do, but a lot of times they ignore the fact that they're not from the same culture uh, as the Afghans. So they they basically gauge all the American soldiers based on their own values, and uh, if they if they go off, it can be offensive and can ruin a, a, a relationship that was built uh, in, in throughout the years. Uh, so coming back to flexibility, I, I realized that I had to play so many roles to make sure um, we succeed in the mission that we're doing, whether it was meeting an elder, whether it was, whether it was a meeting with the local nationals or the uh, Afghan officials. Uh, there was uh, uh, a lot of that. Uh, also the timing. Uh, I, there was times when I got calls uh, at midnight and I was told to call someone else and, and ask for, I don't know, air support uh, or ask for any uh, other logistical support, ground support, air support, or just uh, as easy as relay or pass on this information to the U.S. advisor or the uh, so the timings, or I had to show up to the office in the middle of the night to look at a document, uh, or I had to go on a mission and, and not ex know when I'm coming back and sleep on a, on a foldable cot and in the sleeping bag for days in a row. So uh, that all the, the flexibility that it builds into a linguist, uh, a lot of us do not have military uh, background. So we are not really, that is not a norm for us. That is not something we normally expect a job environment to be. When we are put in that environment, it requires a lot of um, effort on our side and also the teams that we work with to, to see us through those changes and build us into a, a more reliable team player or member of a team. It definitely uh, requires a lot of flexibility and the good news is that you don't have to be born with it. You can learn it as you go and all you have to do is like the job you're doing. If you, right. if you enjoy the job you're doing, it becomes easier. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, those are great points, Ahmad. I mean, the soft warriors are survivors, right? Their, their job and their mission is to create life sustainment for themselves and the people they're protecting wherever they are. And sometimes that means you're doing jobs that aren't necessarily what you were hired for. I mean, sometimes you're carrying water. Right. Sometimes you're exactly. you're you're humping um, MREs or whatever it is you're trying to uh, do. You you know you become um, you become laborers too, as opposed to mm -hmm. just being a, a linguist. And that's the nature of of the soft environment and um, creating a, a situation where you can sustain your own life or those around you uh, with with nothing but the environment. Um, and that defines flexibility. So appreciate. Can I add stuff. something to that, uh, Brian? Of course, Ross. I was you coming know, to you next. Uh, <laughs> Talking about the flexibilities that I've seen it from soft, you know that 
they were like enablers for every aspect that you could think of. <clears throat> for Afghans to, to, to enable them to do, be positive in a mission and also focused on sustain, su sustainability of any kind of, you know, operation and also have short-term, you know, successes. That was for them, it was the main, the main goal. And also, you know, one of the other things that I saw from them is the, the pre-mission uh, training. They would train them with a lot of patience, no matter how long. If they had to postpone a mission for another day or another week, they would do it just to make things productive and make them feel that, hey, you could do this by yourself. You know, just have to follow this kind of a model. And that also, they worked as a partner with them. They worked like, like friends that, you know, that worked underneath them. And they never thought that, you know, they never made them feel like, hey, I was, you know, I have much more experience than you do. With the, whether they were elder or younger, they would treat them all the same and would treat them with a lot of respect. And these, uh, these kind of characters made them very, very successful, especially with the, you know, with the cultural things that, you know, the seniors are treated differently. When you treat them with respect, they will be willing to do anything for you. And that's one of the things that I saw from Soft that was actually making them very, you know, be very successful and as an enabling power uh, for the, you know, for the national, you know, for ANA and ANP. That's great. Yeah. And, and so let's, um, let's go down that road a little bit in terms of the, the, the attributes. You know, like we've, we've talked about um, what it takes to be a linguist in these environments, but what are the, some things that you guys have noticed about uh, the, the attributes of a soft leader that makes you able to do your job better? Um, and, and Jeff, I'll start with you maybe um, from a, a top level of what you've seen from some of our interactions with um, different leaders and different customers we've had that, that procure linguist services from us. Um, what, what do you think um, the key attributes with those, with those soft leaders, those customers, um, have enabled our linguists to be successful? Um, yeah, Ahmad mentioned earlier about the criticality, how just one word can um, change the meaning of an entire dialogue um, unintentionally, perhaps. So I think clear communication is one of those. And that is uh, definitely an attribute that I've seen from the soft community. They understand that they understand the need to make sure that their interpreter or their translator uh, has the commander's intent, specifically knows what the message is. And then it's up to that interpreter to apply that nuance so that the partner nation can understand that. And the other piece is, is kind of what Ross just talked about, which is that patience. Um, there is not an expectation that the interpreter is going to be at what I would call 100% on day one. So they, just like uh, working with their partner nation, they also work with our interpreters to make sure they have to have, that they have the skills and the background and the understanding um, of how to execute the mission. Now, what's What's critical about that? So, how do you how do you achieve that? One of the things that I've I've written down and noted a couple times is in order for that linguist to be successful in supporting those small teams, uh, they've got to be accepted by that team, and there's got to be a trust that's built over time. Um, so that's one of the things that we talked about our to our own linguists going into those scenarios is to to reinforce the fact that. You know, in order for you to be successful, you've got to gain the trust of those operators in the field. Um, and that can be done through a, a myriad of ways. Once again, it's not uh, just saying, hey, it's not in my job description. That's not going to get you there. As you said, if you need to carry water, you carry water. Those kinds of actions build trust very quickly. So, um, yeah, I think, our guy, I think our guys do a great job. I think they've, they've figured out all of these, uh, all these keys to success out there. But, but as, we, as we mentioned at the onset, um, we really rely on the, on the soft teams to be, to be great communicators, to have patience with our folks. And I think those are really the key, uh, the key attributes going into it. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Ahmad, what about you? Um, what, what are some things in your process, especially uh, in the past you know, few years of, of working with um, the diversity of, of uh, customers that you've worked with, um, or, or even when you were active duty in the Army? Um, what are some you know, attributes you've seen in some of the leaders you've worked for or with that, that have enabled you to be successful as a linguist? Thank you, Brian. Um, to add to that, I worked with, uh, since Jeff is from a Air Force background, if I'm not mistaken, right? I, I worked with you guys for over five years. So um, uh, 
that was a good experience. Uh, so coming yeah, everything's to the, nice in the Air Force, I'm not, I, I could, yeah. I, you know, I could have told you if you were ever working with Marines <laughs> exactly. like me, you were yeah. you were sleeping on more of those fold away cots if you're lucky, more more rocks and dirt. But to hang out with Jeff and his people, you're you're in yeah, luxury but, conditions. So I'm sure exactly you met some other ways that. too, though. Sorry, I mean, that was my first five year. I wish that was my last five, so because uh-huh. I'm getting older, it would have been better. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so yeah, the attributes. Uh, uh, I, I'm. I wanted to, to uh, say that these attributes that I learned personally and I appreciate today and it, it became part of my personality, I tried to manually force myself to adapt to it. Um, I did not learn it just from soft community and soft operators. Um, as I said, I started working with, with Air Forces and then Army and then Marines and it's all these different units and, and soft units. Um, I learned something from all of them and I keep all of them near and dear to my heart because they, they built me, they, they gave me that confidence. Uh, the emotional intelligence that I've built throughout the, the years is, um, I believe, incredible. Uh, and that I learned from, from these, these uh, well-trained and uh, weathered officers and NCOs and soldiers on the field because, uh, uh, you know, when times get hard and uh, things get out of hand and it's not, ex- it's not as a, it was expected and pleasant anymore, uh, the negative emotions tend to take over and, and uh, create a chaotic uh, environment to where that unity, that trust, that uh, 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 synchronized operation or uh, day-to-day work that was going on in the within the team falls apart uh, because everyone's now under a pressure that they don't know how to handle. I was definitely one of them. Uh, One of my uh, uh, experiences or one of the incidents, I was in a place called Balamurgab. It's in uh, uh, north of Afghanistan, northwest. Um, We landed there, uh, uh, took some supplies for the units that was there. It was, it was basically a very small, small um, area where they, they were living at, uh, but no, absolutely not even the basic uh, uh, things that you need uh, to, to survive, but they were somehow pulling it off. I, I still today uh, appreciate them. So anyways, I, we landed there and I, me not having any uh, exposure to that sort of environment, Obviously, my, my negative emotions, my fear, my anxiety kicked in, and I, I was about to, to literally cry. Back then, I was obviously younger. This is uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so comparing myself to where I am now versus to what I was going through back then, I see a lot of changes. And I'm thankful to, to these experienced uh, professionals that, with which I work that built this, this habit into me. And emotional intelligence to me is a, is a great one. Um, interpersonal skills, coaching, and uh, as you guys mentioned, patience. All these, they, they have their own significant role that they play in our, in our day-to-day missions. Um, uh, they are all important in their place. Um, and we have, I personally have tried to pick some, if not all of it, some here and there and try to adapt to it. It has helped me, and um, I'm hoping that I will continue to follow that route. Thanks, Abon. Yeah, no, and I, I'll say this, um, and and then I'll, I'll lean over to you, Ross, for the same same question. But you know, from what I've heard so far, the uh, the one theme here is um, it's really empathy. Um, you know, I've heard I've heard you guys kind of you know whether we're talking about the one team and the trust or the patience or the different different interpersonal skills and some of the things you said. The, the ability to understand what the other person's going through is really the critical foundation to that, I think, that I've heard from you guys. Um, and certainly, um, you know, your experience in, in Bolomogab or even in Kunduz, um, both really tough environments, I'm sure, for, for a young linguist like you were. Um, and, and now to you, Ross, you know, some attributes you've dealt with um, that have really enabled you or, you know, certainly you're welcome to share some attributes that are not as... as uh, sure. As, well, uh, you know, some of the... Yes. Some of the things that I could uh, share with from uh, from the successes that SOF brought to Afghanistan is, um, you know what, one of the things that I have noticed and they're effective um, in continuing rotation 
from one group to the next. That was, it's always a challenging thing when the team is that is here that has already had a, you know, a relationship with the, with the, you know, with the uh, Afghan forces. And then all of a sudden that gets to move. They were so successful in it that they, were, they would do it really ahead of time and then slowly but get to, get to know everything about them, teach them everything, go over every little things that were uh, culturally and also that, you know, it's culturally important and also the diversities that they might go through. So that was to me, that was one of the things that I remember always uh, about stuff. And also working with the, with the Intel community, I, I noticed that they, they would link their, you know, all of their Intel, you know, capabilities in Intel, the existing Intel reports that they had, they would adapt it with the plans from the Afghan Intel crew. It wasn't like we're gonna 100% you know, make this thing happen because our Intel, our G2 says that this is the, this is the, you know, this is the plan and this is how we are supposed to go. All right, one of the other things that SOF was uh, actually using as a model is to nurture the local local uh, you know, enforcement officers, the NCOs, and empower them. And that, is, that was by doing that, you know, the seniors and also the, the most experienced to in, appoint them to the key leadership uh, spots. That was very, very, uh, you know, the positions that were very key, they would, just, you know, they, because they had the experience and also they had the, the seniority, they would give them that, you know, in culturally that made the big difference and it will actually, in everybody and in, in their peer, they would, uh, they would show respect to them and they would, it would be something that they would do themselves if they had to do it, but self would do it as part of their culture, make him sure that, you know, they respect their culture and also their, their in integrity by, by doing so. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, more, more uh, theme there of, of understanding the cultural impact of, of that type of action and, and employing things that are going to better everyone around them. I think it's, uh, it's, it's really evident how important, um, understanding the culture and, and the role that certainly our linguists play uh, in, in educating uh, different warfighters on how, how they are, <clears throat> their, their existence in a certain environment is impacting those around you. Um, I think those are critical. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move on to um, our, our last topic here. Um, and I think in, it's important for us to certainly remember the um, those that have, have come before us and those that we have lost, certainly Mission Essential has had its fair share of, of tragedy and, and uh, those who have, have made the ultimate sacrifice uh, for the company. Uh, as you know, you can visit our, our honor wall um, in Herndon, Virginia, where we have 83 of our um, fallen comrades and, and colleagues that are up on that wall who have um, paid the ultimate price. Um, and I, so I'll start, um, Ross, back with you. Um, I wanted to just get a, a feeling for where you feel or have seen um, Mission Essential linguists, yourself or others that you've worked with, um, really stepping outside just being a quote-unquote linguist, um, doing, things, doing things above and beyond what, what is defined in your job description, for example, um, and taking that role to um, really a higher level and certainly not um, not throwing away the opportunity to talk about any, any experience with um, linguists that have paid the ultimate price, but, but more focused on just a, a linguist himself or herself who's, who's really stepped up and, and, and gone above. Um, can, you, can you give us any experiences like that? Sure, definitely. You know, one of the things that I have to say that what, uh, what, what's very important in my, in my experience, you know, like these, all these long-term memories of uh, any kind of mission that, uh, you know, that, that as a linguist we are involved, these are something that actually makes us what we are, at, you know, at, at we are right now. In this, there are valuable lessons that we have learned. And also there are very things that very important the aspects of being a linguist that we never thought we could be involved in. And that itself is the humanitarian aspect of it. And also the aspects of that, you know, being, you know, as a bilingual, 
equal. You you serve both countries. That it's something that is that gives you a, a sense of kind of pride. That hey, you know, I I grew up in this land, and but I have given them what, whatever I can at a critical time that they need it. So it also gives you a sense of pride in that in that regard. And you know, but also you know what, what's what's important as an as a language to be diverse. To be to adapt at any situation and be ready to go when you know at any mission and on that mission and that whatever they require of, of you, you have to follow the rules. You have to follow the certain steps to make that mission successful. And also, you know, as a civilian, I have never been to you know to army to adapt to that you know following the steps that brings you success. That was something new for me. In my first years, I had you know trouble following orders. You know, most of the time, the, the uh, translating documents or any of that was not a problem. But adapting to the to the military environment that was very challenging for me. But it didn't take me too long because I was very close to them every day. I I went to a mission that was in, in nobody has gone to that part of Afghanistan. No security forces has been there. And there we spent a month and a half in that village. And there we learned, we had very close contact with the, with the villagers, but we learned how to save. And I learned every aspect of why we are as a soldier, why we are, you know, why do you become a soldier? When you become a soldier, what are required of you? And when you become a friend with a friend soldier, what you are supposed to do to be a good friend and to be a, a valuable person, you know, uh, keeping your friendship on. So that also it was a you know a valuable lesson that I learned in, in missions that that you know spent days and nights with uh, my comrades and uh, you know friends that, that I made in, in military and also special forces. So it, it, you know, I have learned a lot of valuable lessons that I could uh, give a lot of examples, but there is not time, so much time for that. But one of the things that I have to say that it is, it is, it is something that I will never ever forget. And I always would be proud to talk about it, well, you know, with my kids and grandkids someday. Yeah, no, well, Mission Central is lucky to have you uh, as part of the family as well, Ross. And I know that, oh, thank um, you and, and Ahmad and all of our linguists that do such an important job for us, uh, you know, downrange, as we say, um, you know, you guys are all stepping above and beyond uh, making Mission Essential look uh, as it should, as, as a provider of not just linguistic services, but a provider of real, real people that want to make a difference, like yourself. So, uh, oh, definitely. So, so thank you. One of, the, one of the other things that I have to say that Mission Essential has been, it has involved, it has gone through some changes. And what I've seen, some of the things that they brought, you know, to, uh, to the table for us to make us a better uh, linguist, that also has been very valuable for us. You know, that, that we didn't never had what they, what they call the annual training or online training classes. Or, you know, we have simple things like simply just tips and, you know, the, the tips that we get weekly from, you know, from our HR or our, our, our training crews. That also, you know, it, it brings you, some, sometimes you, you, you do the job and after a while you just forget about little simple things. This would remind you to do the job the best way in the way that's, that's supposed to be done. And also, to, I have to, one of the other things that I have to say about the staff support, man, you know that a Mission Essential has been through a lot of ups and downs, and so have we with it. And, but uh, but the, the support has always been there, man. I'm telling you, I came through, I went through those days that I would come to the airport and stay, you know, there are hours then there wouldn't be someone to to pick you up or someone to even acknowledge that hey you're you you're uh, you're you know you're here you work for mission essential but now it is completely changed you are there way before you get there and that also it makes you feel special it makes you feel like being part of the family mm -hmm. that's great that's great well hopefully we can we can keep that up um, Jeff, what about you in, in terms of you know managing some of these critical contracts for us and in, in, in some really high uh, high tempo locations. What have you seen linguists do that kind of separate us from uh, from the the rest of the linguist providers out there? Yeah, thanks, Brian. So as I mentioned earlier, I had been in an intel atmosphere and environment for most of my career, and switching over to the uh, the linguist world was a, a little bit different. I'll tell you just a little story of one of the first things that I recognized. So. Back in Herndon, uh, we have what's called the Pre-Deployment Processing Center, the PDPC, and that's where all the CAT 2 and CAT 3, the cleared linguists, go through. And I 
made it a point to meet with every linguist as they transitioned through there because I wanted to get to know them. I wanted to understand, you know, what motivated them. I wanted to give them some of my own expectations and things of that nature. And after about four or five sessions, the one common theme that I pulled out of those sessions was the word patriotism. And it really, really struck me. I mean, as Americans, and of course these Cat 2s and Cat 3s are Americans, but as what I would call traditional Americans living back here in Herndon or, or other places, we're obviously patriotic to our own country. While we may have ties uh, through our families to Italy or, or Ireland or wherever, we don't have a patriotism to those countries generally. The linguists I found are different. They are absolutely positively dedicated to America and uh, our objectives, but they definitely have a patriotic tie to those countries that they're supporting. They want those countries to be better than they are today. And I know that's absolutely true, certainly with the, uh, the Afghan linguists uh, that I've met, but, but for the other ones that are operating within Europe as well. That was very, very uh, distinct and unique to me. And I just, I just really appreciated that. And um, not too long ago, uh, we had one of the uh, armed forces media outlets doing an interview in the field with not only our linguists, but the customers. And I just wanted, I just pulled out a small excerpt from, from that article. I sent this up to the president of the company because I thought uh, this is just a snapshot. It's a couple of pages long, but it really, to me, distilled what that support is that we provide to the customers, which once again is over and above the interpretation and transcription and translation. It's, it's what else we provide. But there was an interview with the first sergeant out there, and it said the first sergeant of one of the units remarked that each linguist brings a unique skill or specialty to the team. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, and those, those unique specialties are very important to, to the warfighter. Um, you know, Ross is a good example. He was a veterinarian, but I guarantee you, you know, if we've got a medical emergency in the field, somebody's not going to care that he was a, an animal doctor. They're going to care that he has medical uh, training because that could be life-saving. So that, that is really critical. But the first sergeant goes on to say, in addition to literal translation of spoken and written world, the linguists also serve as an alternate supply chain, service manager, mediator, advisor, and about any imaginable role. And he concluded by saying that I can pretty much give them anything to do and they'll find a way to get it done. I mean, my heart just kind of swelled when I read that initially uh, the first time. And that's why I had to pass it on to others in the community and, and in our company, because to me, that really said it all. I mean, you know, we're out there to provide uh, a service and that service does not have boundaries. And I think our, our linguists are performing that across the board. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. The, uh, yeah, definitely. There are incredible, incredible stories that uh, each one of us has have heard or have experienced at first hand. And uh, linguists, mission essential linguists, from what I've seen, uh, they they um, have always and always gone above and beyond their their uh, contract limitations, their uh, personal, uh, the basically official duty limitations, and. Uh, built that rapport and relationship with the teams that they've worked, they've supported to where at times it has costed them their lives and they've paid the ultimate sacrifice. Um, uh, but yes, there, there, there have been, I personally don't uh, have not luckily or uh, have not been through a situation where uh, I was definitely, at, um, I, I basically pressed my life uh, uh, to where um, that, that I could tell here and share, but uh, this is part of a normal uh, daily life of a linguist, just going out there and, and meeting the villagers, just going out there and having a meeting with uh, the, the elders or the local officials. You never know who's, there are plenty of people with guns and stuff on your side and around that you don't know. Uh, and so if you're lucky, they all, they all uh, will uh, have the same mentality as you do and work on the same team. But we have seen cases where someone out of nowhere has came out and, and uh, created a chaotic situation. I was working in the Air Force as local national linguist and uh, uh, someone just uh, walked into a room at the actual the command and control center of the Air Force and killed nine American uh, Air Force officers and contractors uh, they are in that one room where we had our daily meeting, morning brief every day. 
I was luckily not there at the time, but uh, this, it's basically taking chances every day, taking many chances every day on, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it happens so much that it becomes a routine and normal part of your work to where you don't feel it anymore. Uh, the first days are definitely, uh, uh, if not hard, a little, uh, causes a little anxiety to the linguists that are new. And now uh, what sets us, the mission essential linguists apart from uh, maybe others, um, is that getting used to. We have built that, that um, and if, numbness, if you will, to the, uh, we don't have that sensitivity of being scared every time we go out in a meeting, every time we go, we step outside the wire. Uh, that has become a normal part of life. And when you develop that um, quality, it helps with mission. Uh, um, uh, it, it basically takes away the hurdles that can cause the anxiety and the, the stress that uh, you otherwise would go through. No, that's great. That's great. You know, obviously, um, the, the concept is uh, when you're providing support to a an ODA team or a soft um, uh, soldier or any, any, any conventional uh, force as well, but, but anyone who has a critical mission, um, you have to walk as they walk and, and be one family, one, uh, one yeah. team, uh, use the same terminology, use the same uh, um, uh, respective uh, protocols and tactics that, that any of them would use. So you guys have adapted well obviously to those environments to be able to uh, support, um, you know, the, the critical missions that you guys have. So, so thank you both for that. And, you know, and I, you know, thank you for your time. I know you guys are calling in, um, I assume it's late at night over there, but nine and a half hours ahead of us. So, um, so thanks again for, for everything you guys uh, do for us downrange uh, and for calling in not with, uh, with respect to connect, connection issues and headsets not working and, and anything else that uh, that goes on that gets in the way, I appreciate you guys uh, working through this with with me. Um, last comments from from each of you. I'll go around the horn. Um, uh, Ross, we'll start with you. Uh, any any thoughts before we sign off? Um, yeah, one thing. I mean, you know, uh, getting used to to you know the situation or any anything that come you know comes along. It is it is just that that is part of you know the mentality of being ready, being ready, machine ready, air or critical situation ready. And that also requires, you know, as I earlier said, you know, it is mentality and also physically, physicality, and also that being, you know, in any different ways, any different ways, just feeling like the soldier behind, beside you, like, the, you know, the people that are on that mission, just with the same mentality. And to be um, mission ready, uh, that needs all of that. And um, uh, it's, it was very nicely said by, uh, by Ahmad, that is actually very important for all of us as a linguist to be, you know, ready for that, you know, and that's the hardest thing. Mentality wise, I think that mentally being prepared for a mission, it takes a lot from, you know, <coughs> from all of us. And to be, to be, you know, when you have seen so many of it, then you develop this kind of, you know, you know, precautiously approaching anything, anything that you do, you are very cautious. You are, you know, you think that, oh, this might be the time that I have not seen. It might could happen now. And in, in, in anything that you do, you know, just be extra careful and just extra, take extra precautions like everybody else does. Great, great. Thanks, Ross. Thanks. Amai, what about you? Any, any final thoughts before we sign off? Did I hear my name? Did you did. <laughs> okay, your, your headset starts, I think it doesn't like my name anyway. Um, at, well, no, not really, I'm done. Uh, uh, well, uh, in regards to your questions, obviously, that, that was all I, ha I had to say. And I'm sorry if it was not perfect, which I know it wasn't perfect. Uh, but that was uh, my, my side of the experience of what I've been through, I've, I mean, a little bit of it. Um, I hope it was helpful. Um, Jeff, what about Thank you? you. Any Thank last you. thoughts? Yeah, I really appreciated uh, the opportunity to hear from Ahmed and Ross, and uh, they made it clear to me that their keys to success in their theater are the same as our keys to success in the European theater. And uh, so it doesn't really matter where you're operating throughout the world, the fundamentals remain the same. And uh, once again, it makes me proud to be associated with this, uh, this group of professionals. And that is the one thing that I want to say is, um, 
that is one of the other many lessons that I've learned in this in this new job being associated with a linguist. Uh, being being a linguist is a profession, and they act like it is a profession. It's not just a gig that they're doing in between uh, doing something else. It is, it is something that they are all in on 100%, and uh, it's just a real pleasure to work with them. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to listen to Ahmed and Ross today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. We appreciate everything. Thanks a lot for giving us the opportunity. Great. Thank Great. you, Jeff. Well, thank you all. Um, you know, as, as, as I started out with this uh, webinar, you know, kind of topic was looking forward to hearing from the on the ground truth, if you will, the people that are, that are on the ground doing the job uh, for us every single day. So, uh, so Ross Hussain, thank you so much for, for all of your time and, and your support thank for us you. over the past 11 years. And, Ahmad uh, Saeed for you know three years with us, but your 13 years of support really appreciate everything you've done for for our nation and for for, for Afghanistan as well um, as well Thank as the company. Uh, and Jeff, your your program management in uh, the UCOM Theater is um, is superb. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you for many years there, and, and we'll look forward to many more. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, and for everyone watching, thanks so much for joining us. This has been another uh, webinar focused on the critical topics that support the or surround the soft community and. Uh, we look forward to doing another one, uh, but until next time, uh, stay strong, stay healthy, and see you then.